This is Worship Conference 2017, Broken. Hey, once again, can we clap our hands for this amazing man of God? And, um, Dr. Paul Davidson and his wonderful wife who I just adore so much and I've been learning so much from just watching. And the great legend, you are right in what you say about yourself. Alvin Slaughter and his wonderful wife, Joy. I love you guys so much. Um, man, um, so it's just so much turning in me. Really don't even know where to start. Can we just go to A real quick? Hey, can we just kind of lift our hands and worship? And just, um, can, can uh, the keyboard be unmuted? Who's ever on sound? And if we could just, just open our hearts to Jesus in this moment. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. All over the room, can we just lift that up to him? That's why I love Jesus. To worship you. To worship you. I live. Just one more time, out of your heart. That's the reason I'm here, Jesus, just for you. To worship you. To worship you. To worship you. I live. That's why I lived. That's why I lived. Um, we were up this morning. You can take your seats. We were up this morning um, till about... Uh, I guess it was two something this morning, and um, we, we kind of do that when we're on the road, and we'll just talk about Jesus and, and kind of just celebrate his goodness, and um, we're up discussing, and one of the females who travel with me, um, I've known her since she was a teen, and her and my wife are best friends, and, and we're just talking about how we were so radical, you know, years ago, I've been doing ministry um, for, I've been, I've been sharing in word for about 15 years. And um and, and this song uh, about ten years, but I remember um I remember about ten years ago we were just in passionate passionate pursuit of Jesus and um whenever it comes back on you just continue to play um we were in passionate pursuit of Jesus and and one of the reasons why uh, we're able to to do what we're what we're doing now in in ministry um has a lot to do with what happened back then. And, and back then, one of the things that we were very focused on was creating space for God, creating space for God, um, and, and, and really having a devotion, a life of devotion before him and with him. And, and, and if you just spare me just a few minutes, that's what I want to talk about, creating space for God. Um, recently, uh, my heart was really pricked um, concerning a, a guy in the Bible named Noah. And, you know, a lot of times with Noah, it's how many people were in church for most of your life? You spent a lot of time in church? Yeah, a lot of you guys. Uh, me too. It wasn't optional. I was dragged to church every time the doors were open. Um, and and what the problem with people who were in church often is that the Bible um, Sometimes we diminish the value of the principles in the Bible because we get so familiar with it. And so it just becomes like a fairy tale, like Peter Pan or something like that. And even the story of Noah, if we're not careful, we can miss so many great principles that God is trying to show us within it um, because we jump to the conclusion of the big boat and we jump to the conclusion of the rainbow. We jump to the conclusion of, of what happens and the animals being saved and all that stuff, which is good. But there's a few things about Noah that I believe God wants to teach us. And if Noah had this microphone, he would tell you a few things about himself. And I, I think it's the same thing, which is why I, I started this conversation we're talking about um, my beginning in ministry because a lot of times people see where God's taking you and they make an assumption concerning you, but they don't know what it's taken for you to get to where you got. Um, the value at which, and I say this in humility, not in pride, but the value in which I'm able to minister um, in song in a concert and the value in which um, Reverend 
Dr. Paul is able to minister um, and the value in which Alvin and Joy is able to minister is not it's not based on the few moments that you see them on stage. It's based on the years of walking with God to get them where they are. And that's why, you know, whenever people begin to judge your praise and begin to judge um, the value and the favor that's on your life, they have to be careful because they don't know the story that it took to be able to walk in the power and the anointing. And it's all about the grace of God, but God will train you. He will train you. And the power is really not in the moment. I want every musician and every singer to hear me. The power is not in the moment. The power is in the journey. Do me a favor and tell somebody, that's what we do in America. We have you touch your neighbor, tell somebody the power is in your journey. The power is in your journey. Um, A few things, just very quickly. Um, In Genesis 6, we're introduced... um, to this guy, this is God Noah. Well, actually, we're introduced in Genesis 5, but in Genesis 6, it begins setting us up for this miraculous event, right? And um, in verse 7, God basically tells them, tells Noah what he's gonna do. Listen, I'm gonna clean the earth um, with this flood. In verse 8, I love this verse. It says, But Noah found favor. In the sight of God. Noah found favor. Noah found favor in the sight of God. Hey, I think the first thing Noah would tell us, uh, the first of four things he would tell us, is that I have favor with God. But I love how he defines favor. Because for me, it doesn't really look like Noah has favor. I mean, let's face it. He's building a boat. Probably has never seen rain before. People think that he's crazy. People look at him, you know, he's outside, got splinters and blisters. He spends these years, he and his three boys, building his big bro. It doesn't really look like favor to me, right? Because the way that we define favor is by having good things. You know, when you think favor, you think your nice ride. You think it's the, it's the horsepower of your vehicle. You think that it's, the, it's the, the height of your academic achievement. You think that's the square footage of your home. That's what we think favor is. We think that's the amount of followers that we have on social media. We think that it's our swag and our clothes and, and people liking us. But, but no one says, no, that's not what favor is at all. Favor is a sustainer. Oh, man, this should encourage you because a lot of times the enemy will lie to you and tell you that you're less significant than you are because you don't have what other people have. But the favor of God is not attached to possessions. It's attached to your ability to last. Do me another favor. Push somebody and tell them you got favor. Oh, man, the greatest proof of favor is the fact that you made it out. Come on, come on. Other Things that took other people down, God allowed you to rise above. You lasted beyond the, the torment and the tragedy that you faced. You lasted through unemployment. You lasted past the divorce. You lasted through the molestation. You lasted after your father walked down on you. You lasted, and God is trying to reveal to you today that you have favor. Don't look down on yourself because what you don't have. The Bible says Noah found favor in the sight of God. He had favor. That's the first thing he would tell us. I believe the next thing Noah would tell us, if you keep looking in text, is down in verse 13. God says, I'm going to put it into the earth. And then verse 14, he says, make yourself an ark. Make yourself an ark. Make rooms in it. Coat it with pitch inside and out. And then jump down to chapter 7. It says, Then the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you, your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Verse 5, Noah did everything God commanded him. Verse 7, Noah and his family went into the ark. The second thing Noah would tell us, first he would say, I have favor. The second thing he would say is that I was righteous with God. Righteous with God. Righteous in a wicked generation. Man, that's what got God's attention. He was righteous. And I love how, how, how Reverend um, Dr. Paul told me yesterday at lunch, you know, devotion and righteousness with God, is, is there, there's an answer. I asked him, what's the equation, man? How do you last with God for so long? You know, I know you're only 21, Dr. Paul, um, but how in these 21 years plus uh, a few more, how did you last? What's the, one, what's the secret sauce to devotion and walking with God. And he told me an answer that I'll never forget for the rest of my life. He said, grace. Oh, man. Grace, grace. God will give you the grace to be righteous. Yeah. He'll give you the grace to stand out in the midst of wickedness. If, if no one could ask us a question, he'll ask, he'll ask, do you stand out in your generation? 
Like, like, do you stand out? Is there something about you that's different? And notice the Bible. I love the way God writes the Bible because he's very explicit and very detailed and strategic. And I write it. He doesn't make a mistake. He doesn't say that Noah stood out because he was religious. There's a difference between being religious and being righteous. See, and I, just like what they just said, we're all kind of on the same string. You can be religious and that's the perception of godliness. You can look like you got it together. You can go to church and you can do all the churchy things. The Pharisees were religious, but they still crucified Jesus. The rich young ruler was religious. He said, I kept all your rules, but he still walked away when he had an opportunity to be righteous. There's a difference between religious and righteousness. But the Bible says that Noah was righteous in the wicked generation. Righteousness, righteousness. I believe that God is raising up an army, a remnant of people who just want to be right with him. And it's not just about keeping rules, but it's about having a relationship. See, one of, the, one of the biggest problems that we have in church, especially in America, is that we equate busyness for God to being righteous with God. But you can work, with, you can work for God and without him. See, the difference is, the difference is this. What made, a, what made Adam's and God's relationship so sweet is that he walked with God in the cool of the day. But notice, the fall happened after he missed his time with God. Righteousness, righteousness, righteousness. Noah would say, I had favor, I lasted, I was righteous with God. The third thing Noah would tell us is found in the fact that his family was saved through his obedience. The third thing he would say is that his family was his assignment. Oh, man, I need you to really, really, really kind of take this in. That what your life, this whole thing is bigger than you. It's so much bigger than you. It's so much bigger than you. And I need you to hear that because a lot of you guys have endured battles and have endured um, torment and have endured wars. And, 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 you know, because the coat of favor that Joseph had also came with a target on the back. And a lot of times we celebrate being selected by God and his hand is on me and I'm chosen and stuff. But along with that selection, a lot of times come a target and it comes, attack, comes with it attacks from the enemy. But if you're not careful, you'll think that the attacks have been about you. But the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. The attack is not about you. It's about something so much bigger. And Noah knew that, that the reason why I need to be righteous, the reason why I need to pursue God, the reason why I need to ask him for his grace to stand up before him is because it's bigger than me. Had Noah not been obedient, his family wouldn't have been sustained. Notice Joseph's journey with God. Joseph in Genesis walked with God and he goes through this journey and from the outward appearance, especially, you know, if you erase our, our vantage point of being able to know the end of the story. But, but and Joseph was walking with God and, and to the average eye, it looked as if he didn't have favor. To the average eye, it looked as if God wasn't with him. But Joseph needed to endure what he endured. And I love Joseph's revelation at the end of the story. He said, what men meant for evil, God meant for good. And Joseph had to endure what he had to endure because it wasn't about Joseph. It was about the salvation of his family. Notice he sat at the table and, and, lit, and, and the, the journey and the pain and all of the stuff, when it came to a head, it was really about getting his family and getting the Israelites into, into Egypt in order to be sustained. The battle has not just been about you. It's been about those attached to you. And here's why it's so important because the enemy, because you're such a leader and you're so anointed, the enemy understands that if he could get you, then he could get those attached to you. See, he's not just, a, he's not just after you. And a lot of times we, we, we get that and we're like, oh, man, everybody's just against me. And, and why does this keep happening to me? And why do they leave me? And why do they abandon me? And why did this person break my heart? And it's not just about you. It's about those attached to you. The battle of Jacob and Esau was about the nations that they were impregnated with. When, when Jacob was in a battle with the angel in this divine wrestling match, it wasn't just about the name change to Israel. It wasn't about the name. It was about the nation. There's so much more attached to what you've been facing. And Noah had this understanding that his assignment was his family. His assignment was about what's around him. Three things, favor, righteousness, and assignment. Fourthly, Noah would tell us this very famous direction, instruction given from God. To build an ark and make room. Build an ark, make room. Build an ark, make room. Create space. Build an ark, make room. Build an ark, make room. Now, now, in this instruction of building an ark, we must understand 
that it's not, we're not, it's not just about building a boat, right? There were multiple arcs in the Bible. There was Moses' ark. Also, the ark of the covenant, right? So, there, and, and this ark was the ark of presence. Noah's ark was the ark of preservation. This is the ark that they rode in. Noah's ark, Moses' ark was the ark that he carried. But then there was another ark, the New Testament. Uh, uh, it was the new covenant that was established, right? And so this is the ark of our salvation. It's Jesus. One ark to ride in, one ark to carry in, the other ark that would dwell within us. Now, Jesus is tempted three times in Matthew 4 by the enemy, right? He's tempted by the enemy, first, to turn the stone to bread, second, to jump from the temple and command the angels to catch him, and third, to bow down and worship Satan, and he'll give him the kingdoms of the earth. Now, in the Ark of the Old Testament, I want to share this really quick. In the Ark of the Old Testament, there were three items. There was manna, there was Aaron's rod, and there were Ten Commandments. Manna, Aaron's rod, Ten Commandments. Manna, Aaron's rod, Ten Commandments. So the first temptation for Jesus was to turn the stone to bread. Really, all of the temptations were about what was on the inside of Jesus because he was the new ark. So turn the stone to bread, turn the stone to bread, turn the stone to bread. But Jesus is like, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. So what Jesus is saying is that I am the bread of life. I am manna. It's in me. Second temptation, throw yourself from the temple and command the angels. It was a test of his authority. Aaron's rod stood for authority. And Jesus was like, I don't have to do that. I have all authority. I'm not, I don't have to prove myself, and I don't have to put the Lord the I got to a test. I'm not going to do it. And the third temptation, bow down and worship me. Notice what the first commandment is. Worship the Lord thy God only. So it was a, it was a direct test against the commandments. The three items that were in the Ark of the, Old, uh, the, Ark of the Covenant, which was Moses' Ark, were the three items also that were in the Ark of Jesus. And it was a test about his character and about his nature. The test about his nature. And that's why every time the enemy said, oh, if you are the Son of God, he was actually questioning Jesus' identity. But Jesus knew who he was. And as I was praying and reading this, God just kept I just kept hearing this call to create space and to make an art, to create space and make an art. And I was like, what, is it, what does all this mean? What does all this mean? And I believe this is what God was saying. He was saying the reason why Noah and Moses was able to build out here was because they had built something in here. The reason, the reason why we are able, you know, and it's by the grace of God, not taking any credit, but and, and traveling the world and stuff, it's not really about all of this stuff. It's not about the lights and it's not about, it's about what, what are you building in here? Have you created space in here? Now, I love the instruction of, I love the instruction of God to Noah. He says, make rooms within the ark. Make rooms within the ark. And he said, cover it with pitch. Pitch is tar. The reason he told him to do that is because what he was saying to him was that in the rooms, you need to place tar in them to make them waterproof. Here's the revelation. When we create space with God and when we build our arcs, there may be storms raging out here. <laughs> there may be winds blowing. There may be floods out here around us. But God says, what I want to build on the inside of you will be untouchable by any circumstance. Come on, you won't even feel the effect of it internally. Though your body may be afflicted with pain and though your eyes and your senses may see what's happening, God says, what I'm building on the inside of you won't be touchable by what's going on on the outside of you. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And I believe today that's what he's asking for. He says, hey amen, while you're busy, don't be distracted by your ambition. Uh, while, you, while you have this dream and you have this vision, you're pursuing other things. He says, don't forget to pursue me. Whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever you do, build, 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 build in here. Build something that will outlive you. Build something on the inside. Create space for me. Create room for me. Don't be so distracted by working for me that you live without me. He says, create room for me. 
Wake up early will I seek you. Allow me to interrupt your sleep again. Go back to the well like the woman of John 4. Go back to the cross where we first met. Let's be intimate again. Let me walk with you. Let me reveal something to you. Let me expand your capacity. There's more that I want to do in you. And so many times we can be distracted by what we do for God out here that we miss what God wants to do for us in here. God says, create room for me and build something on the inside that will last. Can we just stand together? And my time is up, but I just want you for for just a few seconds, if you'll just stretch your hands to heaven and just recommit your time to him. It's not about making time for God. (laughs) It's about making time for everything else. Give him your first. Give him your focus. Make space for him in your life. Work your schedule around your time with him. Don't miss your walk, Adam. You know, God asked Adam, he says, where are you? And it wasn't that he didn't know where he was. It was it was it was asking, man, where are where where is our time together? And I believe God, and I love, the, I love what Alvin said about worship in John 4. But something so significant happens there. God in flesh says that the Father is seeking a worshiper. That means it's not easily found. And today the question is, can God find a worshiper in you? Can he find an ark in you? Can he find somewhere, you know, the Bible says that Jesus, as a baby, they were going around trying to find somewhere. Uh, Mary and Joseph were trying to find somewhere. And everywhere they went... They were told there was no vacancy. There's no room here. And I wonder how many churches God shows up to because they're, they're saying that they want him. But he shows up to find out that there's no room for him. No, we have a program. There's no room for you here. No, 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 no. We have our own plans. There's no, there's, I have ambition. There's no room for you here. I have, I have a dream. I have my will. I have my, there's no room. And God is asking today, right here in Wari, Nigeria, can I find space in you? Or is there vacancy in your heart? Is your storage empty? Will you open up and create room for me? Come on, just close your eyes and lift your hands to Jesus and make room, make room, make room, make room, make room, make room. You are my desire, Jesus. You are my desire. Nothing else would do. I've tried to fill voice with everything else, with relationships. Then I still come up empty. I try to fill it with money. Then I still come up empty. God, give me living water so that I'll never thirst again. Fill my cup. Fill it up. Love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus.